The fifth observation is the real downer, and all the time I'm not spending on big data, I'm spending on uh, you know, trying to save our budget. It is crystal clear that we have to innovate only by saving money on our current processes in order to have the investment capital to do the new things. Uh, we are not preparing for the day where someone says, you guys are so smart, and this idea you have is so wonderful. Here's some millions of dollars to invest in it to do your work better. We don't believe those days are in our future. So when you put all these things together, we have higher costs, more demand, new technologies, new data resources, no new money. Unless you challenge those five observations successfully, you can conclude nothing other than what we're doing is unsustainable we cannot go on doing what we're doing. Maybe we can go on for a few years, but eventually we will run out of money. Uh, so what we are doing at the Census Bureau uh, through the creativity of the thousands of people working there is to examine every one of our processes to find more efficiencies than we're now doing and we have this little program that uh, any staff member can write a proposal and if they can make an argument that they can generate cost savings where the investment in the cost savings would pay itself off in three years, we fund it. And we're funding tons of those and we're getting hundreds of proposals and this is the beginning of our way of coping with this future. So that's the end of my shareholders report. Um, from time to time, this will create bumps in the road. Uh, from time to time, we need your help to say, you know, what these guys are doing we think is good, and uh, we'll try to keep you up to date on how we're doing. Uh, I want to talk more about visualization, and uh, this is a effort that we are putting more resources in right now. It's a field that lies among fields. It's not uh, the matter of a single discipline. It's, uh, it comes from a variety of traditions. And it is clear that the contributions to this field are, are coming from all sorts of human thought. Uh, it is a blend of the arts and the sciences and the psychology of visual perception and human computer interface and all sorts of things. So it's a really cool time that we live in and your field uh, needs, uh, th the world is indebted to you uh, for being so innovative in this area. And uh, I want to tell you about how we as statisticians view some of the issues in, in this area. The first thing we know is that uh, data themselves aren't information and uh, the display we display statistics. We collect data. We summarize them to produce statistics. We generally present statistics and estimates, not data, right? Uh, so we have to be a little careful on this. I'm going to show you uh, a picture of data, but we generally don't visualize data. We, we visualize uh, uh, statistical information. And one of the problems is uh, extracting the non-information out of the data uh, to focus in on the informational content. Now, we as statisticians are sort of a, an unusual slice of the data world in that uh, we design data. Uh, we have people who very carefully worry about every data item they obsess over every word of a question that generates a measure. They examine uh, the human behavior that's involved in answering that question. A lot of the data that we now know about are created not by design, but as, as a feature of, of, a, of an ecosystem of data. These are being uh, created as auxiliary to processes. Someone alerted me to the term uh, data exhaust. Uh, 
that there are a whole bunch of processes that are uh, going on, producing auxiliary data, and they're sort of the exhaust of the process. So we have to re remember this. We are work the, the cheapest commodity going forward will be data. Uh, there, that, that's not our problem. Our problem is uh, focusing on the informational side. Now, in contrast to some of you, we, we're sort of a full service shop. We uh, design data items, we then collect the data, but I want to focus on the back end of that. I want to remind us of the tradition of the data collection step. And I want to note that as we move into visualization, our job is to combine statistical thinking and visual thinking and put that together with new technologies that we are all enjoying now uh, to produce uh, the visualization. So we've been collecting data for a long time. Uh, this little picture on the bottom left uh, could be as early as 1790. Uh, and you see how things have changed over time. We rely on self-report a lot. Uh, we are increasingly using mobile devices in various ways. Uh, millions of people respond to Census Bureau inquiries over the internet now. This is a the prevalent mode of data collection on the economic side, certainly. Uh, the American Community Survey will offer an internet option in January 2013. Uh, so basically, internet use will be increasingly common. Uh, believe it or not, every device that we were just talking about is used to fill out our surveys. There was a survey completed on a Wii the other day. I have no idea how they did it, but they did it. Uh, we also tabulate data. We, uh, as a culture, we have a very proud history of uh, developing devices that um, are now full industries. Um, it is notable that one of the first mainframe computers uh, after the Defense Department was sitting in the Census Bureau to help tabulate the census, so that, that is a proud history. Uh, and we, this is the 1970 census. I mean, the, the point of this slide is we've tried to be uh, stewards in an archival sense of data as well. Uh, there were 108 publications with 4,600 printed pages in the 1970 census that we put on microfiche. Now this seems quaint uh, at this point, uh, and it is at this point, but it wasn't at the point it was done. This was like a revolutionary step. So uh, Bill mentioned that early in our history, geographers were there, and although he mentioned his name, he didn't have a picture of him, so this is Henry Gannett, 1880. Uh, before 1902, there was no Census Bureau. What happened every decennial, every 10 years, a project was created to do the census. After the census was tabbed and printed, all those people were laid off, they went off on other things. Uh, we're not as efficient as that now, and we have to keep working uh, to prepare for the next census. And I note that this man in the middle, who is sometimes viewed as the inventor of uh, uh, probability sampling, which really was the engine of much uh, empirical social science economic data, uh, that actually occurred after the um, the hiring of Henry Gannett as a geographer. So we, too, have a proud history in geographical developments. I hope you share that idea. This is one of my favorite early maps, uh, a statistical map that shows the distribution of slave populations. This is an 1860 map. My hunch is people whose names we would recognize from history looked at this map and probably had it in their possession. One Saturday, uh, I did something that was uh, disappointing to me. I overlaid, these are county level um, things, I overlaid the 2009 poverty rates onto this, and the overlap is just horribly consistent. 
Uh, it's a sad part of our history, but uh, the note here is that statistical mapping was an early way of thinking. This is the 1790 map, not made in 1790. Uh, but this contrast is merely to remind us that uh, of, of this proud tradition that we're trying to keep up to date. So I don't know how many of you went to this interactive population map. Uh, so this was on the web after 2010. And a lot of, a lot of user uh, choice in what they were looking at. User choice in dynamic displays of statistical information, statistical graphics, is one thing we're grappling with. How much is too much is a big issue for us in, in all things. So I want to go back to that. Uh, we, as you know, move from statistical information uh, to uh, the presentation of maps with the statistics on it. So this is just an example. Um, this is actually a voting rights uh, 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 table. Uh, we have defined, as you know, geographical entities that are linked to the statistical entities. And then that allows you and the rest of the world now to display in visual form statistical information. And uh, we're trying to get better at that, we're proud of what we're doing, and we're trying to make it more and more user friendly. You know this better than I. Now let me stop on the geography for a minute, if you can put up with that, and uh, talk a little about how statisticians have viewed uh, visualization. And I'll do a little history on this, although there are many early examples of this. Um, uh, just in, in some of our lifetimes, uh, there are others who have contributed greatly. These are some early examples uh, of static graphs. They're generally two-dimensional, sometimes more than two, often two. Uh, and some of them are very, very early uh, uh, in the 1800s presentations of statistical information. So bar charts and, uh, but also notice that color and, and width uh, uh, is, a, is an important attribute that uh, the graphs are, are taking advantage of. John Tukey is uh, held up as an example of an important figure in this. Statisticians are weird on, on many dimensions, but, but one dimension is, although we like point estimates, we also like variation. Some label statistics as the study of variation, right? So we are not satisfied in knowing what is the best single estimate. We also, also want to know, so what's the variability of, of plausible estimates? And so his invention of box and whisker plots that you see on the upper left-hand side, which, which uh, uh, presents the median but also interquartile ranges and spread, was the status, you know, this is like pure statistical desires. If you're going to present something, you better alert the viewer to variation. And that, that's just pure statistics. And runs charts also do a, a similar sort of thing. Uh, Ed Tufte, who writes these wonderfully beautiful books about uh, statistical graphics, uh, labels this as the best. This is the 1812 uh, invasion by Napoleon's army uh, on Russia, on Moscow. In the tan, uh, the width is the number of people. Uh, the x-axis is uh, uh, geographical space, where they are uh, going uh, from uh, uh, source to destination, which was Moscow. And there's also a temperature graph on here. So this is a multivariate graph done very, very early, right? And, what's, and the black is the retreat, the tan is the attack. And uh, it doesn't take long. Right. What's beautiful about this is that you don't have to spend much time with it to get a lot of different stories. And that is a central issue, I think, for us. 
how immediate is the single most important knowledge from data visualization? How immediately is it accessible to most viewers? How long do they have to look at it before they get the richness of the information? How rich should the information be that we present? And grappling with that is something well, we're all grappling. We continue to seek input. So Nathan Yao, if you don't know this blog, you might want to go to it on flowing data. Um, spent a week with us. We're reaching out as much as possible. And this by way of noting that we have all sorts of programs for you to help us. One cool one is called Summer at Census. This is not a camp. <laughs> Although <laughs> some of the members appear to be camp-like. Uh, but it's a chance to bring in knowledge from outside the Census Bureau and rub shoulders with our folks to figure out uh, whether we can do things better. So I alert you to that as an opportunity. Now we know that entering the data visualization side is uh, entering a noisy, ugly environment because it's not just uh, geographers doing this who are serious about their visualization. It's everybody doing this. So one of the problems is how do you do better than average in, in doing this? And there's a lot of junk. Uh, <laughs> It took me a while to get this one on the right, uh, but it is time by country by export of, guess what, <laughs> bananas. Now, why we needed to see those bananas, I'm not quite sure. And, uh, you know, what's the marginal value of the three dimension? And then this poor pie chart on the left. Uh, you know, there's nothing left to be said. You just have to look at that and, and know that there's not much information there. Um, and this is, this is actually my favorite. So here it's clear. <laughs> here, here it's clear, you know, that, that the assistant to the assistant producer was told to make a pie chart. And uh, they did it. But it actually begs the question, so why do pie charts have to add to 100? I don't know. <laughs> and if you don't, don't spend very long comparing the red to the green uh, and the values. Don't be, don't go crazy. Uh, and then uh, all of us have seen mashed up data where there are two data series uh, that appear to have similar movement over time. These are generally time-based graphs. And the author wants us to conclude causality uh, among them. So you might not know. Uh, on the left uh, is the 10-year uh, the, uh, yield on Greek government bonds. In, that must be in yellow. And in black are the number of Facebook subscribers. And so the question there is, maybe we've figured out the cause of the great debt crisis, and it really is Facebook. Uh, even more entertaining is this one on the bottom. If you plot the number of babies who are named Ava, and you look at the housing bubble, it's dead on at the end. Right? So, although we thought they were cute, they were really the cause of the bubble. So. So I guess I have to go back. So we have to be careful, right? These are funny because we think they're deceptive and, uh, and at the very least, confusing. And we don't want to do that. But uh, just as we know that two users of the same estimate may approach the estimate differently. And for one user, it may be a perfect estimate. For another, it would be a quite low quality estimate because their purposes in using it are different. We have to worry about that on, on visualized data. So what do we do as statisticians? Well, we often produce at the Census Bureau means and percentages and ratios and totals. We do a lot of stuff like that. 
But being good statisticians, we also care about variances and standard deviations and skewness and things like that. Distributional properties are pretty big in statistics. That's uh, how we make our living. And then, increasingly, uh, we want to portray measured relationships among variables, the multivariate space. So that's our, that's, that's the meat of what we want to do. And then I think there are four dimensions of contrast that we're always playing with. One is time. Our users want to compare how things are today to how they were yesterday. Actually, most of them also want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. They're not as good at that. Space and geography, that's your business. Uh, all, uh, you know, and increasingly, uh, on those two dimensions, they want smaller and smaller spatial units being contrasted. We can never go low enough. We thought we were pretty good with block groups, people want blocks. Uh, people who don't want blocks want block faces. Uh, so there's no end to this. And then we do a whole lot of contrast on subpopulations, age and race and gender. And then we also look at multiple indicators. Uh, we, we contrast whether the movement in wealth is similar over time, is similar to the movement in income. We're interested in whether components of constructs are moving in the same direction. Do they, have to, do they show the same contrast? So this is our task. These are the kinds of things we do. And then what we're trying to do and what you we'd like you to help us do, is to, to map that onto visualization techniques, right? We, we want to do all those things in a visual framework because we think if we do that, we're actually going to increase the audience, the impact of what we do, rather than presenting <coughs> a thousand pages of numbers and tables. So what are the tools that visualization offer? Well, it's height and width and depth, but color and pattern and translucency, those are kind of the tools we have to deal with. But now with the web, uh, we, we can add movement and flickering. We can, we can do new things, right? They're like new dimensions of visualization. And uh, I would submit, we're just at the beginning of this. We're all grappling to, to, to handle this, but this is what we're trying to handle. So uh, let me go through some things we're playing with. And I apologize before I begin um, to note that if I were really slick, uh, we would have web connections and I'd show you the dynamic movements, but uh, we don't. So. Uh, what this is, if you look at this bar at the bottom, is a visual uh, presentation of uh, population density over time. So you can move that slider bar at the bottom and watch the map move. So this is cool. I mean, people like you and me, we love this stuff, right? We would. We would go back and forth and back and forth. One of the issues on something like that, we like this because it's user-centered, right? It gives user choice. They can go, there are a whole lot of statistics here underlying these pictures. And the picture moves fast, right? That means uh, there are a lot of different pictures that you could get out of this one device. So one of the questions we have is, does this work for everybody? It works for us because we can move back and forth and we, we, we can see movement and we love that. And the real question is, for what audiences does this work? Here's another thing, a similar sort of thing where you can move uh, the, the bottom axis and watch the growth of cities. You can choose cities and move it. User choice is a big part of this. The challenge we think we have is uh, making decisions about volume. How much can we, how many statistics can be simultaneously presented visually 
in a way that a large audience of users can absorb them? Uh, and then how much choice do you give them? You know this book called The Dilemma of Choice, right? Where psychologists have observed that uh, there's, there, there's a burden of giving people alternatives. And if you give them so many alternatives, that that burden outweighs the value of solving, of making the choices, then you're defeating yourself. So we're on that, we're trying to figure out that. I want to give you an example uh, about how we can actually present data, not statistics, visually. Now, why do I make that distinction again? We give our respondents really <coughs> solemn pledges that when they answer our questions, we will not reveal their answers in a way that they could be re-identified. That's a big deal for us. In fact, there are laws that would have me go to jail for five years and have a $250,000 fine. In fact, all the Census Bureau people here would go to jail. We'd all be in jail. Um, that's, a, that's an important thing for us. That's why we don't display data often, because of that risk, especially geospatially or in any way that you could re-identify. But some purposes are served well by displaying <coughs> data, and I want to show you what we're doing on that. And then we have these questions that we all have. Uh, does the visualization, like the banana thing, does it help or hurt? Are we actually, you know, achieving what we want? We think a lot about this uh, penultimate bullet uh, about user types. Uh, the novice user uh, versus the sophisticated user, and how does that map on to user choice? Do, do you want to give novice user, users no choice, just a simple graphic? How do you identify the novice users? And what do the sophisticated users uh, need? That's a big thing. And then finally, the visual presentation of uncertainty. I gave you that Tukey box and whisker chart, which was an early view of that. But now thinking of dynamic visual presentation, could we use some of the dynamic nature of visual presentation with the web to <coughs> communicate uncertainty in ways that would be valuable. So I want to go through a few of these. Here's a, here's a mini-eyes application on the census uh, website that allows you to choose about 200,000 different statistics from one page. Okay. You can plot a whole lot of things by time. You can compare different economic series by time. Uh, you can do it by uh, uh, industry sector codes. So it is kind of powerful. And the question is, is it too powerful for the user? Is it too complicated for most users? And how would we route a naive user around these data? Do sophisticated <coughs> users like this? So again, for those of, uh, for the real data geeks in the economic sector, this is perfect because they don't know what they're going to want and they can come to one site and they can build unique visual displays for their particular problem. But it isn't clear it works for everyone. Here's an OECD thing sort of like that where you can choose a million different things. You can tailor uh, visual displays on a whole lot of dimensions. So again, we, we think the sophisticated users really like this because they're used to doing customization of statistical information. But is it good for the naive user? Uh, this is something we did on the interactive population map. I, I showed you that before, but on the right-hand side, you could see the kind of different displays. Uh, web analytics on this suggests that this worked pretty well, that there was a pretty big audience who liked this. And I think that may be peculiar to the decennial census because a whole lot of users are after a particular set of statistics on a particular geographical space and they know it. This allowed them to go right there and get it pretty quickly without learning a big system. Here's another view of it that allowed you to go back in time. So we got, we got good feedback on this sort of stuff. 
Uh, this had both charting and uh, map displays uh, with the statistics. And then uh, increasingly, we're basically allowing, uh, again, I think these are more sophisticated users, to construct entirely a report that includes graphics, but also text uh, for their particular purpose. We think this is a good thing to do because it offers a lot of flexibility, but it also requires some sophistication. Now, some of the things we're doing with regard to user orientation uh, go to the extreme, I think, or one extreme, and that is if you had a data set that were uh, geospatially uh, uh, indexed, you could add that to our web-based data and produce your own thing, okay? So this is like another user group, right? This is not just sophisticated, but sophisticated and they have another data set that they want to mash up with our data. So we think there's a market for that, but really pretty up, it's a pretty high-end market, we think. Uh, not many people on the streets of New York are carrying around data sets. <laughs> Although I, I don't know that for sure. <laughs> uh, increasingly, we have found, in reaction to this demand for smaller and smaller area statistics, that going down to the data point has value. But if we go down to the data point and say, display that spatially, we run up against this sacred pledge of not revealing the identity of our respondent. <coughs> so instead of doing that, statistically, we have some folks who are creating Synthetic data sets. So what is a synthetic data set? It takes a data set that's based on real people and their answers. It examines the central tendencies of the distributions of every data item, the variation, distributional properties, covariance properties, three-way uh, covariance properties, and then essentially creates a model that creates an entirely new data set that replicates all those means, variances, and covariances. It has the same number of data records, or you could actually produce more data records, it doesn't matter. So for some set of characteristics, you could do estimates and you could display actually the data points of the synthetic data set. And so we're doing it. So here's an example of Atlanta. One popular product we have here uh, allows us to link employees and their residential location, which you see on the left and also on the right, but link to their employers. So you can actually look at the movement from the suburbs in Atlanta into employer offices every day of the week. Uh, and if you're interested, as some in Atlanta are, about where to put public transportation lines in the future, that's a relevant piece of information. These little dots are the result of synthetic generation of data. If you actually looked at the dots from the real data set, which we do, but we don't tell you that, it looks a lot like those dots. That is, for a whole set of users, this synthetic data, visually presented, offers useful information, and it keeps us honest with regard to our pledge. So my hunch, this turns out to be a very popular data product, as we call them at the Census Bureau, because there are all sorts of uses that <coughs> local communities have invented for these sorts of uh, presentation. So I think this is a, a route that you'll see more of us doing, and uh, my hunch is you could help us in thinking about different uses of, of such products. 
Uh, this is just another example of how we might use that. So on the bottom uh, chart, those are indeed synthetic uh, data. But here, it's really for good uh, you know, disaster relief purposes. This is uh, uh, Tropical Storm Lee, I guess, in a particular uh, area. So this is good public use, I think, uh, visualization. You've seen this sort of problem. Um, and so this is just an example of things we're working with on uh, when is visualization helpful, when it's harmful, when is it a distraction from the data, and what are you doing on the right? You know, what is the purpose of the right uh, hand uh, display? What, what do you want to communicate there? So, uh, you know, statisticians worry about fitness for use of statistics. That's a concept we worry about. And that means that you need to know how the statistic is being used before you can assess its qualities. And I think the same sort of discipline is required on, on the visualization side. But the conceptual framework for that discipline, I think we're all inventing as we go through this. And again, we need your help. Uh, here's a good contrast on uh, movement. Uh, they're equivalent, these two graphs are equivalent, perhaps in their informational content. The arrows imply something that the circles don't, I think, and if you wanted to communicate movement, uh, I think that's, in a static display, this is not bad. <coughs> we use something like this to, uh, for public displays of between state mobility to address uh, the concerns of California on why they didn't get another seat this time. And uh, if you look at uh, cross uh, boundary movement, uh, these kind of arrows help. Uh, we also have to think about different, uh, uh, Danny Kahneman's new book on fast thinking and slow thinking. If you haven't read it, you must read this book. Um, gee, everyone's writing it down, so you haven't read it yet. Uh, <laughs> And I think that applies to visualization. So the whole notion of fast thinking is sometimes we make decisions instantly, right? We're doing this constantly throughout the day. We're very confident of our decisions. They're made very, very, very quickly. Uh, but sometimes they would disagree with the decision we'd make if we'd slow down. And I think some of our visualizations are fast thinking visualizations. They're sort of like headlines. Uh, and others are really stories. So this, this goes to a story like visualization. So what's going on here? There are three dimensions here, uh, and there are colors. If I uh, uh, you know, covered up all the legends, you would puzzle over this for a while. This is even more, we've all seen this. I think if you haven't seen this on YouTube, you must go to this site, uh, which is like fun to do. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, five variables at once in a dynamic graph. My mind, for my mind, I have to look at this thing maybe six or seven times before I can concentrate on different relationships. But after I've done that, I feel great. <laughs> if I just look at it once, it is very, very hard for me to absorb that. And I think that's fast thinking, slow thinking. I can't do this fast. I have to slow down. I have to look at different contrasts carefully over and over again. But once I've done it, I have learned a lot. Okay? So I think fast thinking and slow thinking make sense with regard to the design of visualization. If we could just warn people that this is one you've got to do slowly you know, versus this is one you're going to get immediately. The visualization of uncertainty we're just scraping the surface of. We, when we produce a lot of our estimates, we also produce standard errors or margin of errors. Now, I have a bit of a beef with you guys. You tend to ignore those really quickly. <laughs> uh, and I think that's our fault. And I think it's a challenge for visualization to really tackle that. We need to be telling people that some of these small area estimates are really unstable. And we're not telling them that. 
And because we're not telling them that, we're risking abuse of those numbers, and this is a problem for us. Uh, here are other ways of handling this. So uh, let me sum up. Uh, we, we think we're trying to turn data into to meaningful information through visualization, but we also think you and we are part of uh, a new way of handling data and estimates and statistics uh, with their visual presentation that's going to basically change how we uh, go about uh, producing our products, and we think that's a good thing. I'm happy to note uh, that, is it starting in March? Starting in March. We are going to have the visualization of the week on the census website, and we're going to try to wow you. Uh, and we need your feedback on those things. Some will be dynamic, uh, some will be a little crazy and far out, and uh, we want you to tell us when we've gone over the line. Uh, we're very interested in keeping track of how we can widen the audience of our data products by, by doing pictures rather than numbers, okay? So uh, keep, uh, keep, keep your eye out for that, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you.